I think I'll start with this slide. This is just a little filler, but uh, it's a good story, I thought. This is a, a image that was at the Dartmouth gym, and I would see it regularly as I took my kids to swim practice. And I always wondered what the story was with these two guys that had the same number on their jersey. And so I figured out that the story went that they held the world record for the fastest three-legged race. Now, I don't know if any of you run, but that's pretty incredible. They ran 11 second 100 yard dash in 1905. And the fellow on the left, oops, the fellow on the left is, Harry Hillman, who won three Olympic medals and became the Dartmouth coach, which is why his gold medals were up in the Dartmouth gym. But the other day I was walking in a cemetery, West Laurel Cemetery, and I saw the name of the other guy who is Lawson Robertson. He was the track coach at Penn. And he's actually buried near my grandfather's grave. So sort of full closure across 400 miles and a lot of history. So I'm going to talk today about this concept of myelopathy. And this is, I'm distinguishing this from radiculopathy because most of the spine imaging that we do is for patients with radiculopathy. That can be pain in the arm, tingling in the arm, weakness in the hand. Um, the most common of course is low back pain, often associated with unilateral uh, pain or foot drop. But these, patients we're talking about today, these are patients who have a problem arising from the spinal cord itself. And the signs that are associated with spinal cord disease include clonus, hyperreflexia, and a positive Babinski sign. And to point out hyperreflexia is to be distinguished from patients who have a uh, compressive lesion in the upper lumbar spine that affects the lumbar roots. So a good uh, neurologic exam should allow the clinician to distinguish between a uh, cause in the lumbar canal below the conus and above the conus all the way up to the skull base. And the cause can be the result of intrinsic disease in the spinal cord. It could be due to bone or soft tissue near the cord or abnormalities of blood flow. So we'll try to address these uh, as we go along. So the first question you wanna ask as you look at imaging is where is the abnormality? And the compartments that are traditionally defined were intramedullary, meaning the abnormality involves the spinal cord itself. It's expanded, it has abnormal signal, it has enhancement, maybe two of the three. But this involves a primary disease of the spinal cord. Then we'll, we wanna decide if it, the possibility is that the disease does not arise from the spinal cord itself, but it's something outside the spinal cord, but inside of the dura. So these are this compartment is called the intradural extramedullary compartment. And most often these are things like uh, drop metastases, meningiomas, and so on. And then the most common compartment where we'll see disease is the extradural disease. And these are patients with, say, a cervical disc herniation, thoracic disc herniation, uh, spinal, uh, spine metastatic disease, spine burst fracture, that sort of thing. You generally need two views to make this decision, because if you're looking just at a sagittal view, it can be very difficult to distinguish an expanded cord that you might see on a sagittal uh, view might actually be a cord that's compressed from side to side. For example, in a patient with neurofibromatosis type one with bilateral large nerve sheath tumors. In my time, they call that one view is no view. But you can also think about causes of disease. And, and I think you need to think of these together. So some of the structural causes of um, myelopathies are spinal cord syrinx, spinal cord compression, herniation. Then there's intrinsic disease of the cord, and these can be tumor, demyelination, infection. And then you also have to keep uh, in the forefront this idea that you're looking at a vascular malformation, 
that's arising from an interruption in the blood flow to the spinal cord from an infarct, an arteriovenous fistula, uh, and an arteriovenous malformation, which of course is much less common. So let's see some cases. This one, I, I mean, I'm not gonna belabor this case, but I just wanna point out that some patients will have disease in two compartments. And this is a 60 year old who suddenly became parapretic. And you can see that there's abnormal signal in the lower thoracic cord here. The upper thoracic cord looks normal, but you'll notice that there is a disc herniation here. And this is an entity that has been, people have written about and apparently in some of these patients who have spinal cord infarcts, uh, the ones, a couple of these cases that had gone to autopsy, they found fibrocartilaginous material within a spinal artery, which presumably arises from a disc herniation within embolizes to the spinal artery. I'm not exactly sure what the mechanism is, but just be aware that you can be looking at more than one disease. And I think vascular disease is a good example of that. Some of the cases of spinal cord infarcts are actually from aortic dissection. So you need to be looking at the uh, aorta at the same time you're looking at the spinal cord. But we'll start with some simpler cases. So here's a 40-year-old with acute myelopathic symptoms. And uh, I'll show you just a few images. This is the T1-weighted scan on your left and the post-contrast scan on your right. And uh, I'm gonna ask one of the seniors to discuss this case. Uh, you can decide yourselves or... Uh... I can start. Great, great. Um, this is Jane. Do you mean the left one is the T2? It's labeled yeah. the way that, okay. Yeah, that's correct. All right, so I see this T2 hyper intense um, intensity spanning about two vertebral body levels. It's pretty central. And on the post contrast imaging, there is this more peripheral enhancement. So this looks like an intra, intramedullary spinal lesion. Um, and I'll, with, I'll, I'll interrupt and just say that is correct. That if yeah. you were to look at the axial imaging, I'm not showing you all the cases. This proved okay. to be within the spinal cord. Okay. Uh, with more peripheral enhancement, my top differential will be uh, a pentamoma. And, uh, and more like a mass. Okay. So you think this is a spinal cord tumor and you're picking a pentamoma on what basis? Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, what I meant is astrocytoma, not a pentamoma. A pentamoma Astro should, be, should be more uh, homogeneously uh, enhanced. The astrocytoma is also intramedullary, but it's more heterogeneous. Like, yeah, um, not completely, well, yeah. I mean, my, my general approach is when I think there's a spinal cord tumor is to think about three tumors. Well, there's really four. If we, we assume that in these conference settings, I'm not gonna show you metastatic disease, but of course in practice, there's no guarantee about that. So okay. metastatic disease should be on the differential. Okay. But the most common primary tumors, as you've indicated, are the astrocytoma and ependymoma. And sometimes you can distinguish the two because the ependymomas frequently occur in the cervical and lumbar, lower lumbar region or lower thoracic region, and they have associated hemorrhage. So if you see a hemorrhagic intrinsic spinal cord tumor in those areas, you generally favor ependymoma. Now, if you have say subarachnoid hemorrhage or something of that sort, you can really sort of uh, tunnel down onto a pneumoma. But I'm gonna ask is, could this be anything else? Because if you say it's a spinal cord tumor, mm -hmm. then if you have a vigorous surgical team, they might say, well, I think we need to biopsy it so that we can figure out how to treat it. Um, yeah, is there any other history or prior imaging that we can- refer No prior to? imaging, no okay. symptoms prior to this event. Okay, I mean, other central, I mean, uh, spinal cord lesion that I was thinking about is uh, hemangioblastoma. It does not look like this. You'll be more- And how should that look? How does that usually look? Hemangioblastoma is more heavily enhancing. Yes, uh, usually it's uh, like an intensely enhancing nodule. And what's the one feature that you wanna look for in both the brain and the spinal cord that will help you with that diagnosis? And that usually has very intense um, surrounding, uh, uh, what's the word, um, like T2 hyperintensity. 
um, think about this is syndrome associated with it. VH, no, VHL. That's correct. Yeah, yeah. Although they can be without, they can occur without VHL, although some fraction of them, maybe 40% will have VHL. Okay. And we can talk a little bit about that. But one of the things that will help you with that diagnosis, some of those patients will have polycythemia. So there's kind of an odd association between that and polycythemia. Uh, but the important thing in those cases is to look for large blood vessels because all of the hemangioblastomas are hypervascular. And so if you do an angiogram on those cases, you'll see like it looks almost like a vascular malformation. Okay. But what I want to get at is, is this question of when you're confronted with a lesion like this, let's see if I, you want to say, I'm going to say, uh, what should we do next? And uh, for some reason, I think I got too far ahead of it, but your choices are uh, I given here is to call surgery, CSF imaging the lumbar spine, brain the entire cord, and so on. And my, I think what you should recommend at this point is you get CSF, you should look at the entire spinal cord and the brain, and you should bring the patient back before you make the diagnosis of a spinal cord tumor. And the reason for that, this is the flare brain scan in that patient. And even though he had no prior neurologic um, symptoms, he has evidence of a lesion here in the, um, in the uh, uh, midbrain, pontine tegmen, coming into the pontine tegmentum, and this patient proved to have multiple sclerosis. So there is an unfortunate overlap between acute demyelination and spinal cord tumors, so much so that it's almost impossible to differentiate them on a single exam. Some of the patients with demyelinating lesions in the cord will, of course, have brain lesions and other spinal cord lesions. Now, if they all have like the same flavor, let's say there's multiple enhancing lesions in the brain and spinal cord, then you can suggest this diagnosis of acute disseminated encephalomyelitis. So these are patients with, uh, with kind of a single bout of demyelinating disease. But more often you see lesions of different age and character, and these are patients who have MS, but maybe late presentations of disease. And of course, the most, most dramatic presentation is often when there's acute spinal cord lesion. But the reality is that some of these patients with MS lesions of the spinal cord will have no brain lesions and no spine lesions. And so the only thing you can do is follow them and wait to see if the enhancement goes away. And the mass effect usually does too. The, the, um, the reality with spinal cord tumors is there's really no rush to biopsy them because in terms of prognosis, uh, there's no real benefit to an early diagnosis. Unlike tumors like melanoma and lung cancer, where you know early diagnosis is, is critical, uh, in brain and spine tumors, often the uh, an early diagnosis does not really benefit the patient in terms of survival. And I say that within reason. I don't mean bring it back in two years. But if a matter of month one way or another is not really going to change the uh, overall um, uh, prognosis of the patient. So this was a uh, demyelinating disease. Um, here's another lesion. This is also demyelinating disease. This is an older lesion in the sense that there's not much mass effect and there's not really any convincing enhancement of the lesion. It looks a little brighter, probably because it's fat suppressed. And as you know, that changes, gives you a little magnetization transfer contrast, but this is another MS lesion. They're often in the dorsal part of the spinal cord. So I've seen this uh, frequently over the years, and I wanna distinguish that for you from this case, Similar lesion, this is a younger patient. Here you see there's a little expansion of the cord, fusiform high signal intensity. Notice the pattern of enhancement in this patient is a little different. The MS lesion I showed you initially has a peripheral pattern of enhancement, which is typical, as you know, for the intracranial lesions as well. This has a more solid pattern of enhancement, and this would go along with uh, uh, something like a, a hemangioblastoma, although this one turned out to be a pilocytic astrocytoma. So it's really hard to predict uh, histology, I think, from the spine, uh, just as it is in the brain. But this is an appearance of a spinal cord tumor. If I had this case, 
regardless of the fact that it looks like solid enhancement, I still wouldn't call it MS, I'm sorry, a, a spinal cord tumor on the first examination. And I would bring them back in six weeks to two months. You don't want to bring them back too early. I know there's a lot of anxiety among the patients and sometimes among the doctors too, but there's no benefit in bringing them back in two weeks. It tends to just confuse the issue because if you say there's no change, somebody may take that to mean that it truly is a spinal cord tumor. So, so keep that in mind, this overlap in appearance between spinal cord tumors and demyelinating disease. And this is another, yes. Does that peripheral enhancement pattern that we saw in the initial case, does that, um, does that have any like correlation with like tumefactive type appearance in the brain? Well, that, I think you can think of them in the same way. Yes, that peripheral enhancement is common. And there, in a sense, it is a tumefactive MS lesion, only now in the spinal cord instead of the brain. Okay, cool. Thank you. This one, I just want to show you, this is, again, sort of a fusiform T2 uh, prolongation. And I use that terminology. I know some of you use this term of uh, T2 hyperintensity or, uh, you know, and so on, bright on T1-weighted imaging. But... You know, I find that language a little cumbersome, and I think it's clearer uh, in terms of your thought processes, and it's a shorter communication to just say what it is that you're looking at. So if it's a T2-weighted scan and you see high signal intensity, then, you're, then the reason it's bright is because it had the, that tissue has T2 prolongation. So I generally just favor calling it, you know, I say, I'll say I, I see T1 shortening, I see T2 prolongation, I have C shortening of T2, I see restriction of diffusion. I sort of, I try to describe it in terms of what's the actual um, pathology that we're seeing. But this pattern you can see here is different than the MS lesion, right? So this could be an MS lesion, but you'll notice that it, the central portion of the cord is involved and it's exactly in the pattern of the gray matter. And the premise here is that just as in the brain, the basal ganglia are more sensitive to ischemia than the white matter. In the spinal cord, the gray matter is more sensitive than the white matter. And remember, there's more gray matter in the lumbar, distal lumbar portion of the cord right around the conus and also in the cervical spine. If you look at pediatric imaging, you'll often see a widening of the cord in those locations, and it's actually called the, the cervical and um, dorsal cord expansion. And that's a reflection of the fact there's actually more gray matter in those parts of the spinal cord to control the arms and the legs. So this, is, this appearance is actually fairly typical for a spinal cord infarct. So if you see this H appearance, you should favor infarct over demyelinating disease. Here's another patient. This is a patient with uh, progressive uh, weakness. And anyone want to take this case? I, I can take this one here. Um, so uh, we've got two sagittal T2 images of the cervical thoracic and upper lumbar spine. Um, the cord itself looks homogenous. I don't really see any um, abnormality within the cord. Maybe some flow void in the upper or in the cervical cord. But what sticks out is the uh, flow voids along the dural surface in the uh, lower thoracic upper lumbar spine uh, that make me think of like a dural AV fistula. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, and very good. That's a very good up. Now, how do you know those are not CSF pulsations? Because, you know, that's often a problem yeah. on imaging is sorting out, like, for example, this is probably a CSF pulsation, and this is probably CSF pulsation. So why are you sure these are flow voids and not pulsation? Uh, they're not quite as continuous long segment like flow voids, and they're blacker. Um, darker than typical flow ones. Exactly. Yeah, they're quite discrete. Now, when you see this, so you, when you see these flow voids, but there's not really much signal abnormality in the cord, <coughs> you may not be dealing with the dural fistula. Most dural fistulas have T2 prolongation in the cord thought to be due to venous stasis. Okay. So as a result of venous hypertension from the arteriovenous shunt into the draining medullary veins, 
you'll get this sort of edema in the cord from that backed up pressure. But there are other causes of myelopathic symptoms associated with vascular malformations that may be a form of steel. Uh, just like in the brain, when you have an arteriovenous shunt, it means that the artery that normally supplies the, nor you know, the normal tissue, the blood is being diverted directly into the venous system. So that in a sense, you have a starved parenchyma. So, so wouldn't, I wouldn't be too quick with a diagnosis here, but I think your observation is exactly right. And it should be the trigger to then go on and do some more vascular imaging. Anybody want to take this case? 65-year-old with some sensory changes and some gait difficulty. I'll, I'll, I'll try this one. Uh, so we have uh, two, um, uh, two sagittal T-tubes, and then we have an uh, uh, axial uh, T-tube uh, as well. So looking at the... The, uh, at least on the sagittal, there's increase, like mild increase uh, T2 signal about the posterior aspect of the spine, kind of at the levels of C2 and C3. And then specifically looking at the axial, it seems to be in the, like the, the dorsal columns, I guess. Uh, so here's, I mean, the, the differentials would be, uh, and this pattern is... Um, uh, B12 deficiency, or like that, uh, was it, um, subacute degenerative, uh, Excellent. No, that's excellent. That's exactly right. This would be a good pattern for B12 deficiency, and the disease is called subacute combined degeneration. And they develop but like a, you know, almost like a diabetic neuropathy, like they have difficulty knowing where their feet are. Uh, they may have some gait difficulties. They often have balance problems. Uh, and, and I think that's important to think about B12. Uh, and so uh, you do the B12. Let's say I'll give you, um, here's another case, similar finding. Uh, but in this case, they did the B12 and it's normal. Now what? Uh, so now I, I, I got to think of, um, uh, I think potentially infarct or maybe, uh, I think, can syphilis do this too? Uh, well, I mean, infarct, as I say, I mean, I wouldn't say it's impossible. The imaging is a little crazy, you know, this is usual. These are pulsation artifacts you're seeing here. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's not the typical H pattern. It's more that V pattern, sort of adhering to the pattern of that dorsal column involvement. So the question then is, are, are there any other diseases that look like subacute combined degeneration? So this is a little trivia, but I think you need to be aware of it because, you know, you will eventually see a case. We had a case at Penn was a patient who had this disease that we proved by testing uh, and, and copper deficiency can give you the same pattern. And, and you'd say, well, who gets copper deficiency? Apparently this guy was using a lot of dental uh, paste on his dentures mm -hmm. and, and whatever is in that paste binds copper somehow. So he developed a copper deficiency. But there's one other entity that's actually much more common, and that's HIV vacuolar myelopathy. And so I can't say I've ever seen a case for sure, uh, but the literature talks about it. Now, there's some question in the literature about whether it's a true HIV disease, meaning, you know, that the virus actually somehow gets into the spinal cord, or is it really a, manu a manifestation of malnutrition and HIV or uh, B12 deficiency? So there's some overlap in all that. But if you see this pattern, I think those are three things you should think about testing for are B12, uh, uh, copper, and, uh, and obviously if the patient has HIV. So they all will present in kind of a similar pattern with this V-shaped T2 prolongation without much in the way of spinal cord uh, involvement. This, I just want to show you just to touch on the subject of hydromyelia and syringomyelia. This is actually a case I saw today. This is a patient in 2020. This is a patient uh, today. And you can see it looks exactly the same. What I'm not showing is the patients had two or three other scans over that period of time. 
And so this has been called a syrinx, you know, and so on. But I just want you to be aware that you will see cases like this that go completely unexplained. These patients have, often have no symptoms. And this entity is, this is dilation of the central canal that's not really thought to have any meaning. Uh, and uh, you can read about, there's, art, there's an article in the journal, Neurosurgery talks about this, but, but I would say that everyone over the course of their career is gonna see a patient like this where they get followed and nothing changes. Uh, but uh, there are other things you want to think about when you see a cavity like that. This is, again, a dilated central canal. But this patient obviously has something that's impinging on the spinal cord. And you can see the misshapen vertebral bodies. This is a relatively young patient. And this is a case of Schurman's disease. Uh, and some of the Schurman's cases will develop a uh, abnormality or dilation of the central canal, presumably due to some impaired flow. You know, there is supposed to be CSF flow up and down the central canal. And so anything that impinges that flow, and that can be, as in this case, an extrinsic lesion, or it can be from uh, a tumor, uh, can give you a dilated canal. Now, the terminology hydromyalgia syringomyelia and hydrosyringomyelia are all used and sort of passed around pretty evenly. But my understanding of the meaning is a syrinx is a cavity of any variety. Hydro, hydromyelia means that there is dilation of the central canal and syringohydromyelia either means you can't make up your mind or there's dilation of separate cavity and the central canal. Uh, here's another syrinx, and does anybody know what this pattern is called, where you see these septations? The old literature talks about this appearance, and you usually only see it in a large syrinx. I'm, not sure. I'm sorry? The sausage. No, well, you could say that for the shape, but these, these septations, <clears throat> they used to call them stacked coin appearance. And you can see it in myelography sometimes if you actually did a myelogram in these patients, because this space will often, will communicate with the subarachnoid space. You notice there's a little bit of T, uh, T2 shortening here. You see how black this is. And on the enhanced scan, there was enhancement here. This patient, what does this patient have? Hello. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, exactly. This proved to be an ependymoma, right? So we have this little blood products mm -hmm. at the bottom of the syrinx. We have an enhancing uh, um, lesion here. Again, we have interference of the normal CSF flow. And so this is a syrinx secondary to a spinal cord tumor. And then this last case, I'm just going to show it to you that we, did, we saw this syrinx so we looked for the usual things. Is there a Chiari malformation? Is this just the central canal and so on? It didn't look like it was just the central canal, kind of an odd, it was only in this one area. So we did an enhanced scan and there was an enhancing lesion here. So we're, I, I was, this when I was at Penn, I don't think we ever figured out what it was. We were just gonna follow it. But the presumption was this patient had an early spinal cord tumor and that was interfering with CSF flow. And so my, my general approach to these lesions, I don't know if I have this slide. Yeah, uh, whenever, I, whenever I see these cases, I usually go through this list and I ask myself, does the patient have a curare malformation? Does the patient have a tethered cord? Could there be a tumor there? And I usually think at some point in the workup, if it's really, if the patient has symptoms, you really should get an enhanced scan, even if you're kind of sure that you don't see anything definitely abnormal in the spinal cord itself. Like you'll have cases like this where you'll be surprised. Not often, but it can happen. All right, this is another uh, pattern of involvement. Anybody want to take this case? Um, I can I can give it a shot. I'm just trying to decipher if I can tell what's involved here. So it's got an axial uh, looks like a T two. Yeah, no, that's right, T two. Uh, and a uh, sagittal T one and T two. Uh, so I think the arrow is pointing to the. It looks like there's some enhancement, or not enhancement, it looks like there's some T2 hyperintensity almost in the lateral cord, but I don't see a well-defined differentiation between the cord and the adjacent CSF there. Fair enough, fair enough. But it does look like there's some, 
high signal intensity on either side of the midline here. And this is, this slice is at this level. So does anybody, anybody, do you know what the, what this pattern of involvement uh, is called and what it means? I was thinking about more peripheral than central, it's more like a demyelinating rather than infarction. Well, but what is, what's, what's, what's going on with the canal right here? It severe stenosed. Canotic, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, it would be in the white matter tracks, not the gray matter body synapses in the cord since that's spared centrally. So I would say, yeah, it's got to be some sort of like Wallaria degeneration or. And, um, and you have to just be careful, exactly. And you have to be careful because what happens is the cord doesn't look that compressed because with long standing compression, they develop some spinal cord atrophy actually. And so you may actually see fluid around the spinal cord, um, but as, if the cord, the cord is atrophic at this level from long standing compression. So whether the insult is due to mechanical compression or maybe impaired blood flow because of the compression, the, the, the end result is the same. And this pattern of involvement is sometimes called the double barrel sign right? Because it's kind of this odd pattern of bilateral disease. And this is classic for what's called spondylitic myelopathy, which is a, my which is a myelopathy as a result of chronic compression. These patients do not really get better when they get decompressed. They just stop getting worse. So the goal is try to make the diagnosis before you get to this point. The problem is that a lot of older people, and when I say older, I mean, well, older than me, but you know, 70s, 80s, where they can have some narrowing of the canal, but they don't have any symptoms and they usually don't have any signal in the spinal cord. So sometimes it's hard to know what to do with those patients, but just be aware that not every 70 year old or 80 year old who has a narrow subarachnoid space has a, um, uh, co a uh, corresponding neurologic problem that goes with it because the core really can accommodate to a large degree changes in the container. All right. This one is, we're in the same pattern of disease, no mystery here. This patient you can see has a, also has a syrinx, but this is due to extrinsic compression at this level. You can see this right here. This is, and I mentioned dentists because dentists are prone to back problems from leaning over all day long. And I know some of them try to uh, sort of position, position their chair and so on uh, to try to avoid this, but it is an occupational hazard for them. So when you see this, you wanna get a CT scan to give the surgeon a sense about whether the disc is a soft disc or it's a calcified disc. This was a calcified disc. Now, you probably have not seen many patients that get operated on for thoracic discs. They're actually relatively common in the adult population that is small herniations, but when they get to be large like this, and this patient had symptoms and had incontinence and had some uh, clonus, uh, that the, um, the, the, uh, the goal is to decompress the spinal cord again, to arrest uh, progression. Uh, but the way, if you think about where you're located, uh, these can almost never be solved by doing a dorsal laminectomy like we do in, we or the surgeons do in the lumbar spine. And the reason they can do it in the lumbar spine is because when they get back there, they can work around the sac and if they, they try not to get into the sac at all. But when they open from the back here, they're looking at the sac with the spinal cord in it and they cannot ma manipulate the canal to any great degree. So, what they have to do with this kind of disease is they often have to do a thoracotomy to come in from the side. And, and in this patient, they came in, they had to manipulate, come around the aorta and sort of take off this bone here to get to this disc. So be aware that it's not a trivial thing to operate on a thoracic disc. Here's another thoracic disc. Here you can see it here. Here you see it here. This one's not calcified. This is a soft thoracic disc. But just be aware that disc disease, of course, is very common, but it's not limited to the lumbar spine or the cervical spine. It can occur in the thoracic spine as well. This one I'm showing you now is more we're moved out of the intrinsic disease of the cord, and we're talking about uh, things that happen around the cord. This, of course, is going to be in the extradural space, but this is bone projecting in here, which is 
you can see is interrupting the cord here. There's some T2 prolongation. This is called a cord transection, in this case from a burst fracture. So if you call this a compression, you would be semantically correct, but I would, I would suggest you use the term burst when you see a fragment of the body goes posteriorly. So compression usually implies compression, like if this body wedges, you see with osteoporotic collapse, people usually reserve the term compression for that entity where the back of the vertebral body is intact. Whereas when the body goes forward and back, it implies that the posterior longitudinal ligament is interrupted and the anterior longitudinal ligament is interrupted. And this is a burst type fracture. Anybody want to take this case? I can try this one. Okay. So there's two sagittal MRI. The T1, one, exactly. Yeah, T1 on your left and T2 on your right. Very good. Okay. So T1, T2. So there is a um, long segment of cord abnormality. Let's see, it's T1 shortening and then T2 is, there's a signal dropped out. Mm -hmm. um, so this makes me think about blood products is T1, um, yeah. So acute back pain or extremity weakness. If this patient had acute traumatic injury, I'll be concerned about hematoma, uh, epidural hematoma. Excellent. Very good. That is the diagnosis here. And it's and it's and that and that's a very good analysis. And I think it's important to be aware of this entity. It doesn't always have to be with trauma, just as we know that patients in their 70s and 80s can often have spontaneous hemorrhages in the brain, usually attributed to amyloid angiopathy. There is a fragility to blood vessels as people age. And so some of these patients, as in this case, develop a spontaneous epidural bleed. The, the thing to keep in mind is all those rules that you may have learned about the evolution of blood products only apply to blood in the brain parenchyma. So I'm just going to repeat that. The rules only apply to intraparenchymal brain hemorrhage. If the blood is in the subdural space or the epidural space, you can throw all those rules out the window. So blood doesn't evolve in the same way in the same time frame. So this one's interesting because it, this is an acute scan, but it has some of the imaging features of subacute blood, right? There's T1 shortening in here already. And then you have this ex extensive signal dropout from T2 shortening of the blood products. And here you can see the spinal cord is being displaced and compressed. This is an epidural hematoma. It is essential that you make this diagnosis expeditiously because they, you can often reverse the neurologic deficit if their patients are attended to immediately. Unfortunately, a lot of epidural disease, both hemorrhage and infection, is diagnosed late and when they're beyond the window when, uh, when re recovery is possible. So this is epidural hematoma. Here's another patient. This one was on anticoagulation and for some reason, they felt they couldn't take them off anticoagulation. They had a spine catheter in place, uh, and they removed the spine catheter, the, the epidural catheter, uh, and you can see they developed similar pattern, although this one doesn't have any T1 shortening in this area, but you see the T2 drop out. Now, if you're, if you're stuck and you're trying to figure out, you might say, well, this is dark because it's a, uh, a stir scan, but if you're really not sure what you're looking at, there's no harm in just getting a CT scan because as you know, the blood products should be relatively dense. Whereas if you think you're looking at a fat lesion, that obviously is gonna look quite different. So sometimes using CT and MR together can help you make a decision. And this is an important decision because the surgeons are gonna operate if you make the diagnosis of an acute epidural hemorrhage. This one, I'm not gonna, it's not fair because you don't have all the imaging, but I will tell you at one hospital I worked at, the residents all used a spine macro for the cervical spine. And the macro said, uh, CT, non-contrast CT evaluation cannot be used to evaluate the intraspinal contents, period. 
And, and I think that is a faulty way of thinking because, as you know, in a lot of thin patients and good quality scans, you can actually see quite a bit inside the spinal canal. Maybe not at the cervicothoracic junction, but certainly in a thin patient in the mid-cervical spine, you can usually make out the spinal cord, the dura, and the subarachnoid space. The finding in this case that actually was missed uh, in, in, in the night read is that there's a crescent of high attenuation around where you should see the spinal cord. And this is blood in the cervical canal. Now this patient, it's a long story, but this patient had been transferred from an outside hospital. The thought was that they had an aortic dissection. They had terrible pain. They were weak. They were actually scheduled for cardiac cath when we saw this. And so there was a little juggling that went on between cardiology and neurosurgery because the, uh, anyway, they want to do the cath first, but anyway, that's a long story. But the, in the end, this patient went to surgery and that was a, that was actually blood in the subarachnoid space. Here you can see the blood. This is when they opened the, uh, the dura is all this blood sort of thrombus here. And this is what it looked like after they cleaned it out. And we ended up doing a spinal angio to try to find a bleeding site, but we never did establish the cause of the bleeding. This is another uh, extrinsic disease case. Anybody want to take this one? Yeah. All right. Uh, so we've got um, uh, sagittal stir or T2 and then um, a T1. There's. How can you tell the difference between stir and fat suppressed T2? Uh, normally in the spine, you get poor fat suppression on RT2 fat sets. Excellent. Very good. That's true everywhere. And that's because the field, as you know, in the magnet, the field uh, varies uh, from not so much side to side and top and bottom, but in the Z direction from head to foot. So in those areas where the field homogeneity drops off, it's almost impossible to get excellent fat suppression unless you're doing a small field of view scan. So on these large spine field of views, that's exactly right. You usually have incomplete fat suppression in the upper and lower parts of the scan. When you see everything is evenly suppressed like this, this is most likely a stir scan. Good. Yeah, so there's increased signal within the um, three, four, five, six. Looks like C7T1 maybe C5, C6, four. anyways, in the inner virtue of this space uh, with uh, increased signal and soft tissue swelling in the pre-vertebral space at that level as well. Uh, both vertebral bodies adjacent also show increased signal, um, although end plates look intact, but given the fever, neck pain, quadriparesis, I mean, I'd be concerned for uh, dyscosia myelitis um, with uh, abscess, do you see an abscess here? I'm wondering if that anterior is an abscess there. Or a yeah, and I think it's good to wonder about it. But you notice that it's, it's bright like the CSF, but maybe there's something here, maybe not. It's a big decision, right? If this patient has neurologic deficits, then the patient uh, may go to surgery if you say there's an abscess. So what do you want to do now? Uh, I mean, I should do a post-con. We could do restricted diffusion, but they never seem to work in the spine. Okay, very good. So we get the enhanced scan. This is what the enhanced scan looks like. So there's definitely an epidural abscess. That's not what I was referring to before, but it looks like there's also a phlegmon or abs, a prevertebral one um, lower down. Exactly, yeah. So this is all, this is an abscess, this is an abscess. But this, this I wanna just show this, this is what it looks like on axial imaging. So there, some people will refer to this appearance, this thickened uh, dura along here as a phlegmon. But when you have central low signal surrounded by enhancement, which is I call the sandwich sign, you see it here, this is typical for an epidural abscess. And this is an important observation to make. Now, the, there's a little debate in the literature about whether the patients develop symptoms from mechanical compression of the cord or from a septic thrombophlebitis of the draining veins. But in any event, many of these patients will develop acute neurologic deficits that will be, as a patient like this would end up quadriplegic as a result of this abscess. And this is one of the uh, 
uh, unfortunately few but common and often missed uh, reversible diseases that we deal with. So we can't reverse, you know, glioblastomas, we can't reverse, we can manage things like HIV and multiple sclerosis, but this is a curable entity. So it is essential that you make the correct diagnosis. So I would say in any patient where there's a question about an epidural abscess, you should just go ahead and get the enhanced scan because as I say, it's very difficult oftentimes to sort out what's CSF, what's pulsation and what's an abscess because the abscess is fluid and it'll look like CSF on the T2 weighted scan and it'll look like T CSF on the T1 weighted scan. So good epidural abscess. Here's another cause of extrinsic compression. This of course is a spine tumor. Uh, you can see the expansion of the body here. This Some people call this picture framing. Anybody know what this tumor might be? Is this Sean Noma? Uh, that's, a, that's a reasonable thought because, you know, you could argue there's some remodeling here, but there's a lot of loss of bone here, maybe more than you'd expect for a schwannoma. Any malignant tumors that can look like this? Uh, renal cell? Uh, I mean, all, you know, all reasonable thought. I would just say this, this pattern that I call picture framing, you know, where the edge is somehow the cortex is preserved is actually relatively common with plasma cytomas. So this was an isolated plasma cytoma. Uh, here's a patient with osteogenic sarcoma. You can see all the, you know, this is metastatic osteogenic sarcoma. And then this is another one. This is also, you can see this, 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 somehow the edge of the bone is preserved, but you have tumor coming out here. This is another myeloma case. Now, this one fortunately is dorsal, so the surgeons can come after this, whereas if you have it coming from the other side, the, the choices are much more limited in terms of treatment. Dr. Memorian, yeah. how do we differentiate myeloma from schwannoma in general? Uh, usually, let me see, I may have a schwann. I'm going to, I'm not, I have, I have too many slides here to fit in here. Let me see if I can just show you while we're talking about it. Um, this is a schwannoma. And you see that, see the cortex is preserved here. So, so yes, we do have some bone loss here, but it looks, you get the feeling that this is not destroying bone, but it's remodeling bone. So this is, that's typical for a schwannoma. Okay, so again, it's like one is a uh, lytic, true lytic lesion, one is remodeling of bones. The other way you can tell, to be honest with you, is that you see the way the spinal cord is compressed here? Yeah. So this, the only thing this patient had was neck pain. So, so I'm putting it in my myelop myelopathic, you know, myelop myelopathy talk, but a lot of these patients with slow growing tumors, whether they're intradural or extradural, the, the cord will remodel and still function actually very well. So the symptoms can also help you because if this tumor, like a myeloma or plasmatoma grew up rapidly, then when the cord is this compressed, they're going to be very symptomatic. So when you see this discrepancy between symptoms and size and distortion of the cord, uh, then I think you have to think about a slow growing tumor like a meningioma or a schwannoma. Okay. Well, thank I think you. I'm going to save the rest of these slides for another day. I know that there's another time. Maybe we can get together in May. So I'll save them for that time. But thanks for joining me this evening. Uh, any questions before we part? No, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Okay. All right. All right. Thanks for, thanks for stopping by. Thanks.